Okay, so we're going to continue today looking at the scriptures in this series of lessons that I have called, Let's Get Acquainted with the Holy Spirit. Sometimes when I say that, I, I think people might think, uh, I already know about the Holy Spirit. But you know, I'm amazed at how much the Bible has to say about what the Holy Spirit does how he interacts with us, how he works in us and through us and on us and all of that kind of thing. And so today we're going to start uh, looking at uh, more things that the Holy Spirit does for us. And we're going to begin in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. Last thing Jesus said to his church before he left this world. So I would say that that's uh, something that's pretty significant, something that's pretty important. Just stop and think. If you knew you were going to leave and it was going to be a long time before you would see these people that you loved again, I would think that the things that you would say to them in that last moment together would be some crucially important things that you thought they needed to know. And so Jesus said this to those disciples. He said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. I want you to get that. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So for the past several weeks we've been discussing the fact that the God of the Bible is one God. I want you to remember that. Say it with me. He is one God. But that one God has revealed himself to humanity in three distinct forms. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father is God. The Son is God. And the Holy Spirit is God. It's one God who has revealed himself to us in three distinct forms. Jesus confirmed that fact when he described his, to his disciples this two-step disciple-making process that he wanted them to engage in while he was gone. That's the verses we just read. Go and make disciples of all nations. And then he told them how to do it. First, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. There's that one God revealed in three forms. Baptize them in those names and then teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. That's the two-step discipleship process. When somebody becomes a believer, you baptize them and you teach them to obey what Jesus commanded. We've been focusing our attention on this one God as he reveals himself to us and he relates to us as the Holy Spirit. And we're going to continue to do so in this lesson by examining from Scripture three additional activities of the Holy Spirit as he relates to mankind. Three additional activities. That's in addition to the several that we've already talked about. But before we jump into that, let's pray again. Father, we've read from your word. We're going to read some more from it. And Lord, we confess we're powerless to understand it unless your Holy Spirit comes and teaches us what we need to know. So, Father, I pray that you'll do that today. In Jesus' name, and amen. So here's, here's the first one for today, an activity of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit makes believers legally God's children. Legally God's children. As we learned a few lessons ago, the Holy Spirit actually performs the second birth, that John chapter 3, born again birth. The Holy Spirit actually performs that second birth in believers the moment they believe in Jesus, making them God's children in a relational sense. He becomes the Father, we become His children. In a relational sense, in a spiritual sense, we become children of God by the second birth, by being born again. Jesus said it to Nicodemus like this in John chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. He said, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and of the Spirit. It. And then some people get that mixed up. Some people think that born of water is baptism. But if you study through the New Testament, you'll find that baptism is never a birth. Baptism is a death and a burial, uh, quite the opposite of a birth. And, and so this is talking about a second birth. And the first birth, the water birth, is the flesh birth, where, where the, the water breaks and lubricates the birth canal, and that baby is born of water. That's the physical birth. And then the second birth is this spirit birth. That's the being born again birth that the Holy Spirit does. He explains that in the next verse because he says, flesh gives birth to flesh, but then what? The spirit gives birth to spirit. 
So you see, it is the Holy Spirit that actually comes and performs the new birth in our human spirit. And by the way, this is not in the notes, but I want you to get this. The only part of you that's born again is your spirit. Your flesh is still just as corrupted with the law of sin as it ever was. And your mind, will, and emotions, your soul, are just as carnal as they ever were. And the only way you reverse that process is to get the Word of God in there. You receive with, with uh, meekness the engrafted Word, which is able to save your souls. And so, you know, you've got you to deal with that. That's a whole other lesson. But I want you to understand that the part of you that is born again is your spirit. And the, the, the way God does that is in the form of the Holy Spirit. He comes into you the moment you believe in Jesus. And it's the Holy Spirit that performs this second birth and gives life, gives birth to your human spirit. Now, I refer to this as being God's children in a relational sense because as a result of this second birth, God becomes the father, we become his children. So a new spiritual relationship is established, a father-child relationship through that second birth. And for that reason, when Jesus taught believers to pray, he told us to pray out of this relational experience, this relational um, birth that we have that made God our Father and us his children. So when Jesus taught his, his people to pray, when they came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray, he said, okay, this then is how you should pray. And how does he start? Our Father. That's pretty relational, isn't it? The only way we can call him our Father is if we are his children children. Everybody who has been born again, who has had the experience of the Holy Spirit coming in because you believe in Jesus and bringing this new birth to your spirit are children of God. And so our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. However, not only does the Holy Spirit make believers relationally God's children, he also makes us legally God's children through the process of adoption. Now we know what adoption is, right? Adoption is a legal process by which somebody who is not your actual biological child by physical birth can become legally your child through a legal process called adoption. Paul wrote this in Romans chapter 8, verse number 15. The spirit you received, get that? So who's Who's, who's going to be involved in this? The Holy Spirit. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. You see, when it comes to believers being indisputably God's children, the Holy Spirit covers all the bases. We are God's children relationally through the second birth. With the spirit birth. We are God's children legally through this process of adoption, and the Holy Spirit does that. When the Holy Spirit comes into your human spirit, the Holy Spirit stamps a legal document right there in the presence of God that says this person has legally become a child of God. Not only is he relationally a child of God, he is legally a child of God. Do you get that? And there's a big difference. There are people in the world today who have, who have you know, folks that they are really uh, have invested in their lives and, and have a real relationship with, and, and, and they will call them, oh, this is, my, this is my second son, or, you know, this is my son, or, you know, the Apostle Paul did that with Timothy, my son in the faith. That, but there was nothing legal about that. It was purely relational, and the relationship was the same quality of relationship that would have existed had they been biologically that person's son. And so they did that, and people still do that today, right? But there's a big difference between just being relationally somebody's son and being legally somebody's son. And you know what the biggest difference is? Inheritance. Inheritance. You get that? So this is part of, we become legally God's son so that someday when the father gets ready to dispense his inheritance, we get in on that. Because of this adoption that the Holy Spirit brings about. The, the, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And so we need to get that. He makes us both relationally and legally God's children. He covers all the bases, relationally through the second birth and legally through adoption. Now, the adoption process will be inarguably completed 
when believers receive a new body in the resurrection. You want to see who it is that has actually been adopted? Wait till the resurrection comes. Everybody that gets a new body is inarguably, undisputably, not only had the second birth, but been legally adopted as God's children, and there won't be any doubt about it then. When the trumpet sounds and the voice of the archangel rings out and the dead in Christ rise and get this new body and those of us who are alive and remain are changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, nobody will be able to doubt then who got it and who didn't, who's legal and who's not. And that's what this whole process is all about. Look at what Paul wrote. He wrote this in Romans 8, 23. We ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit. He said those people in that generation... They were some of the first ones to get all the benefits of this Holy Spirit coming and doing all this stuff for them. He said, we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we eagerly wait for our adoption to sonship. That process has already been started. The documents have already been signed. But the process will be completed by the redemption of our bodies. Do you get that? He says, we groan inwardly as we, as we eagerly wait for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. When we stand in the presence of Jesus in redeemed bodies, nobody will doubt that we are God's children, not only in a relational sense, but in a legal process called adoption to sonship. The completion of that process happens when someday we get a new body and we stand in the presence of of Jesus. This is just another one of those things that the Holy Spirit does for believers. And I hear pe people talk all the time about the Holy Spirit did this, Holy Spirit did that, Holy Spirit did something else. They don't talk about the stuff that the Bible often talks about as far as the work of the Holy Spirit is concerned. Now let's look at another thing that the Holy Spirit does. Not only does he give us the new birth, you know, relationally and, and adoption, which is this legal standing as an adopted child of God legally, he does this to us. Once we get this second birth and, and once the process of, the, of adoption to sonship is started, then the Holy Spirit starts teaching us the truth. The Holy Spirit teaches us the truth. That's just another thing that he does for believers. Referring to the Holy Spirit, Jesus said this in John chapter 16, verse number 13. He said, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come. Who is the Spirit of truth? That's the Holy Spirit. Why is He the Spirit of truth? Because He only teaches the truth. He will never teach anything that is not true. How can you tell if the Holy Spirit is the one teaching you or some other spirit is the one teaching you? Look at the Word of truth. You get that? Study to show yourself approved unto God, workmen that don't need to be ashamed, rightly dividing... The word of truth. The Holy Spirit takes the word of truth and uses it to teach you the truth. So if some spirit is teaching you something that is contradictory to or not supported logically by the word of truth, then it's the wrong spirit teaching you. That's how you discern the spirits. That's how you determine which spirit is teaching you and whether or not you should grab hold of what that spirit is teaching. It's only truth if it is confirmed in this word. If it's not confirmed in this word, you need to leave it alone. I don't know what else to tell you. And so... That's what he says. He says, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. So the Holy Spirit teaches believers truth. He guides us into the truth. That's why the Holy Spirit is called the spirit of truth. Because one of his jobs is to guide you into all truth. Now, the Holy Spirit guides God's people into truth by teaching us God's word which is the word of truth. So when we study it, then the Holy Spirit guides us into truth by helping us understand the word of truth. You see, God's word is the only reliable source of absolute truth. It's God's word. The only reliable source of absolute truth is this book. Now, you can read other books written by well-meaning Christian men and women, and I'm all for that. 
Because they can help you understand things from their experience and all that. But don't believe anything written in their books unless they can demonstrate it to be the truth by giving you scripture. Just because I say it or somebody else says it or somebody else writes it down and you say, oh, it's a published book, they're an author, it must be true. Not necessarily. It's only true if it can be confirmed by this book. That's why if you want to get a book, and if it's really a good book, and if it's really a book that's going to lead you into truth, there needs to be a lot of Scripture quoted in there. A lot of Scripture quoted in there in its context, in its historical setting. A lot of Scripture in there. And uh, it's important that you get that. And so God's Word, as I said, that's, it's the only reliable source of absolute truth, and that's why the Apostle Paul told Timothy what he told him, and we already quoted this, 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing, properly interpreting, correctly uh, understanding what? The Word of Truth. So we are supposed to study the Word of Truth. Truth. To study means to get into it and to commit to mind important facts from it. It's not just reading it to get the big story. That's just reading. To study means that you're going to memorize some important facts that are foundational to the understanding of the whole thing. There are just some important facts that you need to get. And if, you, and if you don't get those important foundational facts and you try to build on a foundation that's not solid and true, then whatever you build on it's going to have problems. And so we need to understand that. That's study. Jesus clearly declared that God's word is a reliable source of truth when he said this to his father. He was praying in John chapter 17, verse number 17. And by the way, in John chapter 17, this prayer of Jesus is actually the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> that one back there in Matthew chapter 6 that we normally call the Lord's Prayer is a model prayer. They came and said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And he said, okay, when you pray, pray like this. And then he gave them a model. He gave them an example. He gave them some guidelines for prayer. But when he actually prayed for us, that's in John chapter 17. And in that prayer, one of the things he said to his father is, your word is truth. You get that? Your word is truth. Now, I want to give you this. I want you to understand this because a lot of people, even in the church today, don't, don't grab hold of this nearly firmly enough. And that is, if you read something in your Bible, and then you go to high school or you go to university, and some professor teaches you something that is opposite to that, that is in conflict with what you have read in your Bible, and they got all kinds of scientific facts and all that, uh, all kinds of reasoning and logic to support what they believe, and they put you in a position of either choosing whether this is true or whether what they say is true, guess what? This wins every time. You get that? This is the word of truth. So you must evaluate everything else that you're ever told based on what this says. Okay? Because Paul in the New Testament referred to science falsely so-called. In other words, there, there are things that, that people can try to, try to demonstrate scientifically, but if they start with a faulty scientific premise and build on that to arrive at a conclusion, then their conclusion is going to be faulty if the foundation they started with is faulty. Do, do you get that? You, you got to understand that. This is truth. Everything else must be measured by this. We determine whether everything else is truth or not based on this. Now, I, wanna, I want you to understand one more thing about this word of truth. It is easy to recognize a lie if you know the truth. But if you don't know the truth, then it's easy to be sucked into a lie. Do you get that? Recognizing the truth is essential and the only way you're going to do that is the holy spirit teaches you the truth as you study the word of truth let me give you an example of this at the u.s treasury department they train agents that work for the united states government to recognize counterfeit money that's one of the, that's their job 
that, that go through much of the currency that flows in and out of, of the, the, tre- the different treasury offices in the country. And these guys look at all these bills, all these bills, all these bills, all these bills, day in and day out, day in and day out. And they can in- instantly recognize counterfeit money. You know why? They say, well, they must study what counterfeit money looks like. Oh, no. They never look at any, they never study and look at any counterfeit money in their training. They become just absolutely, positively familiar with the real thing. They study all the details. They study all of the intricacies of real U.S. currency. And then when they see something that is not real U.S. currency, it stands out to them. That's the way the Word of God is. When you study the Word of truth, then anything that is not truth will suddenly leap out at you and scream, Lie! 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 And do you understand why the devil is able to deceive so many people with his lies? In American Christianity today, people don't study the Word of truth very much. They don't. They they can't even tell you the books of the Bible. They can't even tell you who wrote what. They can't tell you what any theme of any book is. They can't even, most of them can't quote you hardly any scripture. No wonder the devil's so successful at lying to people and causing them to believe things that are not true and then causing them to behave based on what they believe. And when they behave in, in, in inappropriate ways, that eventually gets them into bondage. And then they need to be set free. How do you get set free? You know the truth, John eight thirty two, and the truth will set free. You free. That's why it's so important that we understand that one of the activities of the Holy Spirit in the lives of believers is to learn the truth. Jesus indicated that one aspect of the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit is to remind us of everything Jesus himself has said. Notice how Jesus explained it. In John chapter 14, verse number 26. The advocate, which means the counselor, the comforter, the helper, the Holy Spirit. So this advocate is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. So what does the Holy Spirit do? He's a teacher. He will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. That he will teach you all things, and he will remind you of everything I have said to you. One of the ways the Holy Spirit teaches us is reminding us at just the proper moment, just when we really need it, he will remind us of something that Jesus said. You get that? But now I I have to help you with this. It's not as easy as it sounds. You can't be reminded of something you don't know. I try to do my wife that way sometimes. I'll say, um, remember such and such and so and so. Well, the problem is I never told her to begin with. <laughs> Can you remember something you don't know? No. So unless you get in the Word and learn the Word and understand what Jesus said, then there's no way the Holy Spirit can remind you of what Jesus said. He can't remind you of something you don't already know. That's why it's so important we get in the Word. So if you want your Holy Spirit to be your teacher and to remind you of what Jesus has said, you got to get in here and see what Jesus has said. And it's an amazing thing. You get that stuff all filed away in your brain, and you might not be able to just pull it up at will. How many of you, you say, man, I know that there's a scripture somewhere that says something like this. You might not be able to pull it up at will, but man, at just the right moment, the Holy Spirit can pull it up. He can remind you of it. That's one of the things he wants to do for us. And so it's important that we get that. Here's the third thing that the Holy Spirit does. Not only does he make us legally God's children, not only does he teach believers the truth, but here's what else he does. The Holy Spirit helps believers pray. Tiffany kind of mentioned this when she was giving her little testimony this morning between a couple of the songs. When she said, You know, everything's falling apart and it's not good and all I can do is say thank you. You don't even really know what to pray for. She said, I don't don't even know what I'm thinking him for. How many of you at, at times situations come along, things happen in your life and you say, God needs to do something here but I have no idea what he needs to do. I don't even know what I should pray for. You been there? I'm there often, a lot. Okay? And here's the amazing good news. 
When we're in those situations, we don't have to worry about it. The Holy Spirit will help us pray for exactly what God wants. You see, as believers, we have many weaknesses. We have many weaknesses. What a comfort it is to know that the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. One of our weaknesses is we don't know what we ought to pray for. We just can't understand what the circumstances demand. The particular weakness that Paul had in mind when he wrote that statement was that there are times when believers know we should pray about the difficulties that we're going through or maybe the difficulties that somebody else is going through in this broken world, but we don't know exactly what to pray for. We, we don't know exactly what to ask. It, it, it's amazing that at just that moment, the Holy Spirit steps in and intercedes for us. He begins to pray for us so that we can then pray about the situation adequately, even though we may not be aware of it. He begins to plead our case before the Father, asking him to provide just what we need. That's what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, verse 26, the last part of that verse. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us. When the Holy Spirit is interceding for us, when he is pleading our case before the Father, we won't even be able to express his prayer in words. You get that? You, might not even be, you won't even be able to put it into words because the Holy Spirit is not doing that in your mind. He's doing that in your spirit. We might not even be able to put it into words. We will groan within, but we can't put into words what the Spirit is saying to the Father on our behalf. And that's why Paul said this in Romans 8, 26, the last part of that verse. The Spirit intercedes for us through wordless groans. The King James Version says that he puts it like this in the, in the, in the New King James, and the Old King James is about the same. The Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. What does it mean to utter something? It means to put it into words. It means to speak it. It's saying that the Holy Spirit is interceding on your behalf to the Father. He's doing that from within your human spirit, and you can't even put it into words. Now, I've been in some church circles, and I have friends in these church circles that, that take this verse and say that there's such things as holy groanings, spirit groanings. And that somehow the groaning is the prayer. No, it just says you groan inwardly and you can't even put it into words. It's just that inward longing for God to do something, that groaning from within from God to do something, but you can't even put it into words. Um, I like this now. The, uh, the New Living Translation says it like this. In, in, in that same verse, the last part of Romans 8, 26, it says, the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. So if you can put it into words, then you're praying, not the Holy Spirit praying in you. And it's okay for you to pray in words, but what he's describing here is a different experience than that. So we don't need to be concerned about exactly what the Spirit may be praying on our behalf. We might not be able to comprehend it well enough to put it into words because the Holy Spirit has the awesome ability to pray in exact harmony with God's will. That's why he's better at praying than we are. How many of you, when you're praying, get to the place where you say, God, I don't really know what to say here, but just do what you want. I pray that way a lot. God, I don't know what needs to happen here, but you do, so we're just going to commit this person to you and let you do what you know needs to be done here. You ever pray like that? And that's okay to pray like that. But the Holy Spirit's got one up on us. He knows exactly what to pray every time. Because he and the Father are one. They're so intricately united that he knows, he knows the will of God every time. Here's what Paul said in Romans chapter 8, verse 27. The Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Get that? Every time he prays for you, he prays in exact harmony with the will of God. I wish I could do that every time. But when I can't do that, the Holy Spirit will step in and do that for me. That's an amazing thing. I really like the way this verse is translated in the New Living Translation. It says it like this. It says, the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. 
I like that. One more thing I want to point out is that the Holy Spirit will not do all of your praying for you. You say, well, if the Spirit's going to pray for me, then I don't even have to pray. No. No. No, you need to pray anyway. But when you get to the point that you just don't know what to pray, then the Holy Spirit will step in and do some praying for you. He only steps in and helps you when you don't know exactly what to pray. That's it. And I want to tell you something. The more you get into the word of truth and be able to see life from God's perspective, the more you'll know what to pray. Because the more you'll understand the will of God, the more you'll understand what God wants. But if you don't get into the word and learn to do that, and you should do that, then the Holy Spirit's not going to come in and say, okay, baby, I'll do all this for you. He ain't going to do that. Because he wants us to grow up and just be obedient in what it takes for us to be able to pray in harmony with God's own will. So get this, look at it again. Look at what Paul wrote in that verse. The Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. When we don't know what we ought to pray for, the Holy Spirit will step in. But when we know what to pray for and we just don't pray, he ain't stepping in. And you know, things don't go so well when you don't pray. How many of you learned that by experience? Man, when you don't pray, things don't go good. When you, you have not, because you ask not. So here's the conclusion. As we close this, this lesson, I want to remind you of three vitally important additional things that the Holy Spirit does for every believer. The first one, he makes believers legally God's children. That's what Paul wrote, Romans 8, 15. The spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. Second thing, he teaches believers truth. Jesus said it in John 16, 13. When he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. And then the third thing, he helps believers pray. That's what Paul said, Romans 8, 26. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the spirit himself intercedes for us. He'll step in and plead our case to God on our behalf. He does that for us. Now, bottom line fact here. The Holy Spirit doesn't do any of that for you unless he has first made you both relationally and legally God's child. Unless he has actually come into your human spirit through this process of the new birth, through this, this moment that you believe that Jesus really is who God says he is, until you believe in him, that's John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The moment you believe in Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes in and brings that eternal life, that new life into your spirit. You are born again. You get the second birth. You are relationally God's child. And then the Holy Spirit immediately starts drawing up the document, the legal document that makes you legally the, a child of God. So all the bases are covered. From then on, the Holy Spirit's going to work to do all these things in you to whatever degree you cooperate with him.